Stay tuned for tonight's adventure with the Fat Man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and welcome to the Poe Chronicles. Yeah! <laughs> okay, guys, have fun. All right, so we're going with the Poe Chronicles. Right? I always knew I would get to Edgar Allan Poe eventually, you know, when I started my show, because he's such a central figure to the history of Baltimore and the literary arts world. Right? Major, major figure. Right? I just didn't know how I was going to get to him, and that took care of itself with this bombshell article here and how it talks about Poe's remains not being in the right place and seeing the date on it of September 9th, 1845, you know, and knowing that, and knowing that Edgar Allan Poe didn't die until October 7th, 1849, that just blew my mind, right? But there, there were some issues. And so now these pages, pages two, three, and four here of this paper that I had downloaded, I found in a, a folder that I had marked September 9th, 1854. But seeing the date, it made me think that somehow I'd either transposed the num uh, the date and downloaded the wrong paper. Because I think I was looking for connections from from September 1904 to 1854, something Jubilee related that I just <laughs> can't remember what it was now. Right? But I realized I didn't have the front page, you know, because now I'm really curious. I have to look into this, right? It just can't be that there's this article about Edgar Allan Poe's remains four years before he's dead, right? So I went back and I did download the front page. And here, they do have the correct date. But on pages two and four, they have it reversed. So now, at best, the typesetter is at fault here. And he just reversed the five and the four. Or there could be some sort of trickery going on here when you're looking back. Confusing of the dates deliberately, maybe for some other reason who knows i don't know <laughs> but it's you know it's fun to think about it that way but it, in, in all likelihood it was just poor typesetting but one thing that's also amazing about this page and it's on page two here going back yeah so i've been doing i've been into this over a week or so or whatever and now i'm setting up my windows to get this episode rolling and it says this notice right dr a b arnold will deliver a lecture before the hebrew young men's literary association of baltimore Right? Subject, Flavius Josephus. Right? The public is cordially invited to attend. Right? Now, this is going to be... At, now, this is absolutely amazing when we get ahead in, like, episodes two or three or however long this is going to go. Because the, uh, the Arnold name is huge in this story. Right? And I cannot... It is just cannot be a coincidence that they have this notice with this finger pointing right to the name Arnold next to Edgar Allan Poe here and this article about his remains not being in the right place okay <laughs> so when i decided that yes all right it's now it's time right there couldn't be any more clear a signal that it's time to look into poe i started just by going through and watching some documentaries about him on youtube i figured that was the best place to start the gatekeeper information and what better place to start than any biography? <laughs> and one thing that's very interesting that we're going to see going forward, looking at Poe's history and stuff, is how loosey goosey they play it. You know, they get to pick and choose and they don't really emphasize certain things or they emphasize some things over other things. They completely ignore stuff depending on the biography or, or video that you're watching. I watched, you know, about a half a dozen of these things over the last week or so. And so here we are, a minute and 38 in and you know, we're going to talk about his history a lot, but I just wanted these names showing up, and this is supposed to be his mother here. And again, we're going to get all into this, right? We got Dickinson, Fox, and Poe all right here. And when I saw these names, right, Dickinson is huge in, in Pennsylvania and, and the University of Philadelphia, and he's, you know, Continental Congress and, and so on and so forth. Big, big shot guy. You know, he connects William Penn and Benjamin Franklin and so many other people. Fox. Fox is the family name of the founders of the Quaker faith. We have Poe all right next to him. And so right away, I was like, whoa, this story is going to be taking me in places that I, I'm not expecting. Right. And also interesting here that we have a Pope and it will become more interesting as well that there's a Powell here. All right. But really, I just right off the bat, I couldn't. I, I couldn't believe the, the names that they put right in front of me, which aren't 
And these names do not feature, or Dickinson and Fox, do not feature in any way, shape, or form just about anything else I followed up on. But bang, there they are jumping out right at me. All right, and so I wanted to start with, we'll just take a look at what the gatekeepers want us to know about Poe, because I only know the, the myth, the legend, you know, the lore of Edgar Allan Poe, right? I don't really know that much about him as a person, you know, and there's a whole lot about him in history that may or may not be true. It's There's a purposeful, there really does seem to be an attempt to sort of cloud his true nature. You know, is he, was he, you know, there's a lot about him as we're going to discover going forward, but that seems deliberately muddied up <laughs> in the record, you know, at least to me, right? And so what they tell us right off the bat is, you know, he was the American, he was an American writer, poet, editor, and literary critic. And now this becomes a really important piece of who Poe was and how he fits into the overall story here, right? Best known for his poetry and short stories, right? He is widely regarded as a central figure of romanticism in the United States and of American literature as a whole. And now romanticism, we're going to get into this because romanticism is part of the mechanics, part of the wheel works in the manipulation of our subconscious. Right. And I, I haven't talked about them yet so much, the romantics, I don't think at all. But here I just wanted to bring this out really quickly. Right. And how, you know, they they talk a little bit about it, but it was at its peak from 1800 to 1850. Yeah. You know, the whole time the Poe was alive. Right. Among so many others, we get so much out of this romanticism movement. Right. It says it was embodied most strongly in the visual arts, music and literature. Right. And who is controlling visual arts, music, and literature, but the Royal Society, right? We know this, right? And it had a major impact on history or historiography, right? And historiography is the study of the methods of historians in developing history as an academic discipline. And so they romanticized our history to make it more interesting and perhaps really stretching the boundaries of what our history truly was, right? And they use this romanticism to do that, right? Education, chess, the social sciences, and the natural sciences, right? I love that, right? It's a natural science. I love that it's got a picture of a universe here, which may or may not be natural science, right? Given what we're figuring out about spectroscopy and so forth, right? Right, but it's concerned with the description, prediction, and understanding of natural phenomena you know, based on empirical evidence from observation and, spe and experimentation, but with a romantic twist. <laughs> right? So this romanticism is a controlled thing. It is, you know, deliberately put out through the university system and trickled down to the masses to make life more appealing, you know, or, or to give, like to add an appealing nature to the frequency that they're you know, lowering our subcon, you know, lowering our vibrations to, right? And this, this makes life more tolerable, the idea of romanticism and romance and, you know, and I'm a helpless romantic, no doubt about it, right? Right, so Poe is considered a central figure to this, right? You know, and especially given the nature of his poems and his love poems and so forth, and we're going to talk all about that, right? All right, and this becomes even more amazing because he's the inventor of, the, of detective fiction, Right. Think about that. Right. Detective fiction, dete the detective genre, the mystery genre is the biggest thing in literary and art and like visual medium, like TV and movies and stuff like every other show. <laughs> it's like a mystery. Right. It's unbelievable. Right. The importance of the mystery genre. Right. And he and he also he really furthers along this, this genre of science fiction in a way. And we're going to talk about that. Oh, there's just so much to get into with him. Right. This this Poe Chronicles is going to be an amazing thing. This, this Poe Chronicles is going to be an amazing journey, no doubt about it. And so it says that he was the first well-known American writer to earn a living through writing alone, resulting in a financially difficult life and career. And now this last statement here is one of the things that really drives home the importance of Poe in the narrative, because who is he? What is he? He's an archetype, right? He is the archetype for the starving artist, you know, for the helpless romantic who you know, slaved for his art, but never made it, you know, certainly not in his lifetime. He did experience a little bit of like public success, but never financial success, right? So without him, without him in the narrative, 
you know, there may not be people like Charles Bukowski or even like, like Vincent Van Gogh or somebody like Nick Drake, you know, these tortured artists who never really broke through and some, you know, had tragic ends to their lives, right? You know, his is an important part of that story. And I, I don't think there's a better, <laughs> I don't think there can be a better example of the importance of the archetype than this which I uh, picked up from my friend Virginia over the weekend. I just can't believe how much it ties in. It's ridiculous, right? And it's something called Discordianism. And so what Discordianism is, is it's a fake religion that is the central, I, I believe it's the central religion in Robert Anton Wilson's novels, The Illuminatus and Schrodinger's Cat and things like this, right? That's what they, you know, I never read those books, but Robert Anton Wilson, I am a little bit familiar with, and he's a very interesting cat, you know, no, <laughs> to borrow from Schrodinger. <laughs> and, you know, you should definitely look into him if you don't know anything about him. What Discordianism is, uh, if read literally, it encourages the worship of the Greek goddess Eris, known in Latin as Discordia the goddess of disorder or archetypes. All right, and so, you know, what the Principia Discordia does, as I said, it's a sacred text of this Discordianism and it lays out the rules, which of course there are no rules anywhere, right? And the goddess prevails, right? You know, and, you know, it's, they have this interesting sort of mantra about the truth and what could be true and not true and what's real and not real and so forth, you know? There's a lot of like the liar's paradox kind of thing in there, right? And so, you know, I'm, I'm reading, I'm scrolling along, and then I see this, this is Poe, and I'm like, what? <laughs> right? I'm, I'm making Poe out to be, like, the archetype, right? right? And the Discordian society has a manifestation that calls itself Poe, which is unbelievable. A tribe of philosophers, theologians, magicians, scientists, artists, clowns. You know, and similar maniacs who are intrigued with Eris, goddess of confusion, and with her doing. Right? And Poe here is an anacronym for Paratheoanemetamistichood <laughs> of Eris Esoteric. Right? Unbelievable. <laughs> the non-coincidence there, right? And that fake religion <laughs> of the Illuminatus. <laughs> And so putting Poe in that archetype role and seeing how he fits in with the Romanticism movement, you know, and that time frame and, and what this movement could have been used for, among other things, you know, not just entertainment, which of course it has that value as well, but what does that entertainment bring? You know, is there a price for that entertainment? You know, and so, and, and filtering all of this through the false paradigm prism that I have, right, the way that it's been presenting itself to me, you know, it's now time to start digging deeper into, you know, who was Edgar Allan Poe? And the journey there, of course, starts with the last name. And so that's what we're going to pick up in part two of the Poe Chronicles. <laughs> I, I hope you guys had fun with this one. It's going to be a great series. All right? And remember, just because you don't know the truth doesn't mean you can't have fun with the lie. Right? Okay, until the next one. Cheers, guys.